All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our weekly um, Bible study here at Center United Methodist Church. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this rainy Thursday morning. Uh, some much-needed rain falling down out there. I'm joined by my colleague, fellow pastor, and member of the Creation Care Committee, uh, the Reverend Keith Sexton. How are you doing this morning, Keith? Doing great. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, glad to have you. Now, uh, you are up in Roanoke Rapids right now, if I remember correctly. Tell us a little bit about your ministry up there. Well, I've just begun a new appointment at Rosemary United Methodist Church in Roanoke Rapids. And my wife, who's also a pastor, is serving a church seven-tenths of a mile down the road at uh, First United Methodist Roanoke Rapids. And uh, we are collaborating, the two churches are, with a community garden and have just begun uh, the fall season uh, with organic regenerative practices in place. And we can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, but we're, we're working with the soil and with the cycle to uh, capture carbon in our, in our garden. So that's uh, as well as feeding our community. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Everything else, like, you know, in a brand new appointment, you're learning everything, bumping into walls and trying to learn traditions. And so that's where I am right now, trying to navigate my way. Yeah. Very good, very good. I, I love the idea of the community garden. You know, that's that's been a huge part of my ministry here at Center, and and I think that churches have that land. They need to be using that land to to bless those around them, not just to cut the grass and keep it looking pastoral, but actually use it in a pastoral way. Um, amazing how that works. Um, all right, so. Well, we're continuing our, our season of creation series and looking at what creation teaches us about God and, and using the end of the book of Job as a jumping off point for that. And so we're going to get into uh, that in just a minute. I'll open us in prayer. And then we've actually got two different scripture passages this morning. So I'll open us in prayer. And then Keith, if you want to share the passage from Job, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the rain that is coming down and watering the plants, feeding the earth that in turn feeds the rest of your creation. As we turn in our scriptures to these passages for the day, by your spirit, open our eyes, open our minds, and open our hearts to what is taught therein, to see your wisdom all around us, and to give up our own foolishness in favor of your wisdom. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Uh, the first passage is from uh, Job 38, beginning with verse 22 through verse 30. God is answering Job in the whirlwind. And so we should hear this passage as if each time God asks a question, before Job can begin to answer it, he gets whirled around by another question. And so uh, your head is, should be spinning at the end of this reading. And, and uh, I hope you'll feel Feel that Job sense of, uh, I can't answer the first question. Have you entered the storehouse of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way of the place where light is distributed, where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt? to bring rain on a land where no one lives, on the desert, which is empty of human life, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, to make the ground put forth grass. Has the rain a father who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Thus endeth the lesson. Our second scripture comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 12 and then 22 through 31. I, wisdom, live with prudence, and I attain knowledge and discretion. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up as the, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, 
before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soul. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So Keith, we've got the, these two passages that um, might not be obviously connected, but there's definitely a connection in here. But going back to, to what we talked about last week that, that you missed out on, uh, this is God redeeming Job, God putting Job in his right place and right relationship with God. And last week, we talked about the, the vastness of creation. And, and this week, we're going to look at God's wisdom that's on display in creation. And so I, I want to start with that, that bit from Proverbs, where wisdom is personified. Wisdom is, is the one speaking out. Uh, she's uh, um, portrayed as, as a woman out in the streets trying to, to teach people. And here she's saying, look, before anything else, God created me. God had wisdom before the earth was established. And then in the establishing of the earth, God used wisdom, right? All, all that God made, God was wise in the making. And, and I go back to my seminary professor who described wisdom as, as not someone far away who's just putting out little bits of advice. But wisdom is a skilled craftsperson. So a wise carpenter is someone who builds well. A wise farmer is someone that farms well. A wise parent is someone that parents well, right? And so God is a wise creator. Therefore, creation is done well. It's created wisely. And so tying that back to Job, here last week we looked at God pointing Job to how the earth is founded and and the depths of the seas and the heights of the heavens. And here God's pointing Job to the weather. What do you know about the weather? It's going to change in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you live in North Carolina, you can experience all four seasons in one day, right? Exactly. Yeah. But what we do know about the weather, uh, particularly Ida proved it, is that weather has become more extreme. Storms have become stronger. They've dropped more rain. Um, I remember when um, Hurricane Irene came across Oriana when I was pastor there, the eye literally passed across this. It was a, a level one hurricane, but it had a lot of rain. And I saw the devastation that one could do moving slow. So with that and the wildfires that are going on in the West, we're seeing something different than we saw when you were a child or when I was a child back in another century. So, yeah, yeah. And um, I think you're the first one that ever described my childhood as back in another century. And dang it, you're right. And that makes me feel old. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You're well, I was referring to me, but uh, if the shoe fits, wear it, I guess. Yeah, it, it, it does. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure that the 80s were only 10 years ago, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so when we look at the weather, it, it is constantly changing and it's very complex. When, when I was in college, I took a meteorology course as one of my, my general science courses. And a good friend of mine is, he is now a meteorologist with the National Weather Service and at the time was, was studying meteorology there at NC State with me. And I, I took the course thinking, all right, so my, my buddy David's gonna be able to help me out, help explain this stuff to me. And, and he was not helpful at all because weather is extremely complicated. Right? All, all these things that go into it, is it, we, we of course like to make fun of the, the meteorologists, the, the, the weather forecasters on the news because they get it wrong you know, at least half the time. 
but that's because weather is so complicated. All the different factors that go into it, and and just that looking at a hurricane. You know, my, my wife is from San Diego. She did not grow up with hurricanes. And I quickly realized after she moved here that she thought that hurricanes could just spring up at random like a tornado. And so I had to explain, like, no, we, we see them coming from a long way away. We have a pretty good idea of where they're going. But at the same time, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, you, you look at that track and there's a good 300 mile zone where it might come in somewhere in this 300 miles. And I remember uh, the last hurricane that hit North Carolina, Florence, um, my oldest, unfortunately, has lived through now two 500-year flood hurricanes uh, in her uh, seven years of life, and at that time, only five years of life. And you know, Florence, everybody made this, this very big deal around here in Sanford about preparing for Florence because we were on, on the track. It's going to come. Windows were boarded up. People were hoarding gas and getting generators and, and grabbing food and all this stuff. And everyone's new, like, all right, Florence is going to come right through here. And instead, it hit the coast. It just sat there for days. It sat there dumping rain. And I remember my oldest saying, Dad, this is the most boring hurricane ever. <laughs> well, it, I, I suppose from your perspective, it is. But yeah, you're right. We're, we're dealing with with these very complicated patterns and cycles that, that we have not seen before. And yeah, at the same time, we're talking about God's wisdom. So, so what, what are your thoughts on that? How do we look at this complicated and unpredictable and becoming more and more devastating weather patterns compared mm -hmm. to God's wisdom? Well, this may not be a great analogy, but weather is like family. There are a lot of relationships in weather. Um, um, high pressure, low pressure systems, humidity, heat, um, and those sorts of things. And sometimes weather becomes dysfunctional, uh, like a family. And that's why meteorologists have their difficult times. And we can say that the dysfunction we're seeing in weather could be the result of lacking the wisdom to care for the earth in such a way that we're not impacting the weather negatively. So we're making a dysfunctional family more dysfunctional by adding dysfunction to the atmosphere, uh, adding more uh, carbon and greenhouse gases with our lifestyle. So um, it's sort of we're getting what we uh, we're getting what we planted. Um, you you reap what you sow. So that's that's my understanding of weather. Is we can't do a lot to control the weather, but we have certainly done a lot to influence it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know a, a very popular analogy I've heard over and over as evidence for God as a creator is, you know, if you found a, a watch just washed up on the beach, you wouldn't assume that that watch somehow just formed out in the ocean on its own. There, there's got to be someone behind it, intelligent to, to make that watch. And watches are very complicated. And, and all of, I'm, I'm talking about like a real genuine watch with all the little moving gears and springs and all that fun stuff, very complicated. And they all interlock and they, they work in different ways. And yes, that's, that's a really good analogy for this creation because we, we as, as humans tend to, to lock things in boxes, right? Okay, we have the weather cycle over here. We have food production over here. We have carbon emissions over here. And, and that it, they're, they're not that nice and neat. They're all interlocking and working together. In God's wisdom, God made them to be that way. And yes, as we disrupt them, then, you know, well, okay, I, well, I thought I was disrupting this over here, but it turns out I'm disrupting everything because it, it all works together, right? Another way to, to, to look at this is another uh, argument uh, of God's existence, and it's called the unmoved mover, the entity that set everything in motion. If we apply Proverbs and, and Job, what we hear is that God's movement in creation is wise, and it has a plan, and intricacies, whether it's the, the Nautilus shell and how that pattern is repeated throughout the universe, or whether it's the carbon cycle of life and death, 
that dying things give off carbon and we can use that carbon to give new life to our plants. So God has a wisdom there. So the disruption is when we, we choose to be unwise, as we talked about earlier, when we choose an unwise way, we actually become discreators working against God. So that's really what's at stake, I think. And, and the conversation with Job and with Proverbs is we need to be humbled and awed at creation and through that humility and awe, seek to work to move the way God would move, to, um, to act the way God would act. And that may be the lesson of Genesis 1 and 2, is stewardship is doing in God's stead what God would do if God controlled these hands and controlled this mouth and, yeah. and so forth. Now, you, you threw out a term just a second ago, the, the carbon cycle that uh, there's a chance some of our, our listeners are not familiar with. So can you explain uh, very briefly, because I know it's complicated, all these things are complicated, but what is the carbon cycle? Well, um, on one side of the equation is trees. We'll use that. On the other side of the equation is humanity. We breathe in the atmosphere and take from it oxygen and put out carbon dioxide. The trees and other plants take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it into sugar and also turn it into carbon that is then passed down by the roots into the soil. And the trees and plants uh, exhale, as it were, oxygen. So what you have is there is a cycle by which carbon that we release from our uh, respiration is captured by living plants particularly trees being one of the strongest engines for this. And those things create the, the simple sugars that create our fruit, our vegetables, but more importantly, the, the roots put that carbon back in the soil where it belongs. And so it kind of goes back to scripture, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. We are made of carbon. When we die, we become dead carbon. And you want in your compost, a combination of carbon and nitrogen. Uh, some compost formulas have 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, uh, which is significant. Uh, but that carbon nitrogen um, fixation in the soil through plants allows us to have a balanced atmosphere and a balanced weather. And when we interrupt that cycle by adding more carbon, to uh, the atmosphere through uh, emissions in our power plants and automobiles, um, even emissions from uh, animal flatulation, I mean, in our, in our food, uh, meat industry. All that is overcoming the ability of the current forests and plants to, to cycle that back down into the soil. So every time we knock down a rainforest, we're literally taking a lobe of the earth's lungs out of the earth. Yeah. The earth can't breathe as much and can't overcome uh, what we're doing to the carbon cycle. So basically it's an equation, how much carbon we put into the atmosphere and how much that the plants can take out of the atmosphere. Uh, yeah. Yeah, think exactly. of it as a debt cycle. You know, we're creating debt and the plants are paying it off. Yeah, and, and the carbon cycle is, is a great example of God's wisdom on display in creation, right? That God created creatures, animals, plants that, that can live in this balance. Carbon is, is the building block of life. And because we are a closed atmosphere planet, there is a finite amount of carbon. Some of it's going to be in the air. Some of it's going to be in the soil. Some of it's going to be in living creatures. And so as long as we maintain that balance, there's the right amount in the air. There's the right amount in the soil. There's a the right amount in animals. There's the right amount in plants. And it's just cycling through cycling through cycling through but then yes as as we start to eliminate this over here you know the the, the plants that are sequestering carbon from the air and and putting it into the soil well then more carbon or yeah more carbon is remaining in the air well then we are harvesting things from the ground we're digging into the ground uh, we're taking fossil fuels out we're releasing carbon into the air we're decimating wetlands which releases carbon into the air. And so the carbon's building up and building up and building up, and there's less and less that can pull it down. And so eventually this thing that God designed to be the, the building block of life 
the thing that allows our life to sustain and continue on this earth becomes the very thing that kills us, right? The excess of anything leads to death. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Paul wrote, in all things, moderation may be a, a better understanding in all things with wisdom um, in moderation. Um, God set the, the equation in place. And when we mess with the equation, what we end up doing is getting things out of balance. And if anyone's had their checking account out of balance by just a few pennies, you know how aggravating it is to find that small thing. But we're not out of balance by pennies. We're out of balance by billions. And it, it, we are coming to the precipice of can we, can we sequester enough carbon to keep the earth from going to a place of, of massive human disaster? So let's let's return to to Job because I I frame this God is pointing Job to creation as a work of redemption, right? God is restoring Job to right relationship, and so where in God's wisdom within creation, where do we find redemption? Well, as we read Job today it seems that the first thing we need to deal with is our hubris and our uh, pride and our lack of awe and humility. Um, I have a farmer friend, a farmer parishioner who um, graphs everything about the farm, uh, the, the, the health of the soil at the beginning of the season, every day's temperature, every day's rainfall, uh, heat units, um, and he graphs this out so that when the production of the soil happens, he can look at the production and all those variables, which are weather related, which are atmospherically related, and can predict the next season what his best planting could be based upon the forecast that he can deal with. So there, there is wisdom in how he farms. Um, it, it, it's, it, that's what we need to be doing. And I think what's at stake here is that we've lost that sense of wisdom uh, about this whole thing, because what we're most concerned about is the outcome, not the consequences to get to the outcome. Uh, more, greater, bigger, better, um, higher profits, all that, but at what price? And that's that's what's going on with the conversation with, with Job is there are things you don't know about creation that only God knows. So we have to go back to uh, the first commandment to be fruitful and multiply. There's only one way to do that, and that's to use God's wisdom. Because anything outside of God's wisdom, it will create an unfruitful situation, and the multiplication will get out of balance. Uh, and so that's, that's where, where I read from Job is take a step back, realize God is God and we are not. Yeah. Yeah. I keep this uh, quote from, from Norman Wurzba on, on my desk. Um, just a, a little bulletin board right there behind me. And um, he, he writes, the key to successful gardening is that the gardener be available to learn what the garden has to teach. And yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's it, right? Being, being in right relationship means not dominating and so Job is not to dominate God, and Job is not to dominate his friends, and Job is not to dominate what God has made. God's saying, look, look at all this. You can't dominate this. You can't control the weather. You can't make this happen. Um, but domination has, has really been the theme of human history, right? We, we try our best to dominate. And so redemption comes in realizing, you know, we, we, when we dominate, we destroy and that is, is involved with our carbon cycle that we talked about. It's involved with our relationships that we have with one another, whether it's, it's these interpersonal relationships, you know, with, with our family, with our neighbors, with our church. Uh, it, it's, it's involved in our, our racial relationships, right? Why, why are we in such a, a bad state as far as racial relationships go? Because of attempts to dominate. And say, no, 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 you have to be subservient to me because I was born this way and you were born that way, right? 
so much of, of human history comes back to that, that mentality of I have a right to do something. But when we look at, at God, God say, no, 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 you don't have a right to do anything. That is essentially the issue at stake is uh, in a lot of conversations is our rights versus our covenant responsibilities. And if we read scripture uh, carefully, we see a set of covenant responsibilities and redemption requires regeneration, starting again, a new beginning, a new life, a new birth. And in order to redeem the harm that we have done, we have to literally repent, turn, and go in a different direction. And in that different direction, we find regenesis, new birth, a new beginning. And um, the hardest thing to change is not necessarily what we call the heart, but what scripture would call the seat of, of our will, which we call the mind. Um, until our will becomes like unto God's will, we're going to continue to need uh, a fresh redemption uh, and a fresh rebirth. Uh, and, and so the hardest thing about this entire story is humanity in our first sin chose to be our own God. And we're still fighting that battle and um, regenesis, regeneration requires us to die with Christ in a baptism like his in order to be risen to new life. And that's literally a die to our will. And that's what's at stake. What's at stake is not something political, theological, or ideological, but something more fundamental. And that's our will and our desire to win at the stake of someone else losing. And I don't believe the gospel is a zero sum game, some win and some lose, but a way for all of us to be in the place of blessing and redemption. And that's, we've lost that, that part of the, uh, of the equation. We, we, we're, we're fighting the wrong battle, who wins and who loses versus how we all can be redeemed. Yeah. And, you know, it always, always, always comes back to grace, right? That, that we have messed us up really badly. Um, but God is still working within us. God is always at work within us. And I, I get so frustrated with Christian teaching that limits it to heaven, right? It's all about getting us mm -hmm. to heaven. No, it's not. It's about changing your life now. It's about God working to move you out of that death-bound sinful state into a kingdom of God dwelling righteous person that God intended you to be all along that's mm -hmm. not self-centered that's not selfish that's not putting themselves on God's throne right and so God's grace there in us redeeming us teaching us that humility and when we get it wrong God's grace saying hey you got it wrong repent try again right the whole notion of eternal life gets turned on its head if we take Jesus seriously uh, in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus defines eternal life this way. Eternal life is to know God and the Christ whom you sent. And that word know is not an intellectual know, but it's the kind of know that you have between a husband and wife that's lived together for 60 years. That deep kind of knowledge where not only can you finish each other's sentences, but you can know that person in a way that no one else can know, that deep knowledge. And then Jesus in his prayer does not pray that earth would go to heaven, but that heaven would come to earth. So maybe eternal life is best understood as our work to know God in such a way that heaven is breaking into earth, that the kingdom of God is breaking in to these broken places. And that eternal life can begin now, not after we die. Mm -hmm. And that notion needs to be reclaimed because I, I want to believe that what scripture, scripture is teaching 
is we are working towards the day when every tongue confesses and every knee shall bow. And we are one with God again in how we deal with creation, how we deal with one another. And that's when the kingdom of heaven fully breaks into this, this place and it's transformed uh, completely. And so we shouldn't be waiting to die to experience heaven. We should be planting heaven here. That's sort of my read of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Again, I'm drawn back to, to the work of Norman Wurzba and one of the things he wrote, and I'm going to misquote this, is I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, is why would we think that we would succeed in heaven when we're destroying the paradise that God already created and put us into, right? Um, why, why do we need to go to paradise when we could be living in paradise? Right, Bring, bringing about God's kingdom right here. Uh, I mean, that's... That, the very first thing that Jesus proclaimed, according to the gospel writers, is what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. It's within your grasp. Therefore, repent. Stop doing the wrong. Start doing the right. Yeah. I would encourage those who are listening to this to, to uh, Google and watch the movie The Biggest Little Farm. Um, they start with what we would call spoiled land. And they work with God's creative wisdom to return the land to a place of fruit, fruitfulness. And with this wild animals return, so um, you have the wild and the domesticated living in harmony. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a picture of Eden. And, and I would also remind us that we set up national parks to have unspoiled land. Well, what does that presume? That somehow in other places we have spoiled the land. So um, if you've ever been to a national park in those unspoiled places, you see how God's creation is living in harmony and that the natural ecosystem is working and it is beautiful and it's all inspiring. It is the wisdom of God overcoming you. Um, so why wouldn't we want that same kind of beauty and wonder and, and, and unspoiledness in our communities, in our backyards, in our, in our, in our church lands? So yeah, that's, where I, that's where this takes me, is to that place of, of unspoiled harmony with God's plan. Yeah, that's a great place to end it because we are out of time. But I do want to give uh, you a chance to, to plug your webinar that's coming up. Um, give us give us your elevator pitch. Why should we tune in and, and when should we tune in? Okay. Um, our um, webinar, Jacob Dye, another pastor, and I have put together a toolbox, and we're calling it Regenerative uh, Regeneration 2.15 based on Genesis 2, 115. The goal is to see how we treat the soil of our church property, of our members' property, and of our community property in such a way that it restores the soil and restores the soul. So I'll just give you the, the, the 30 second piece. Imagine the grassy area of your church being transformed into a garden, a native planted garden with pollinator plants and a beekeeper keeping, uh, I'm a beekeeper, um, uh, a hive nearby and, and, a, and a food forest and a walking trail. Um, and what happens, it becomes a place where people can sit and pray, sit and meditate, and the soil's health makes the soul healthier. And if we remember correctly, it was from the soil of the earth, the hummus, that God created humanity to be a living being. So what we want to do is, is teach how to use the practices of regenerative agriculture to restore the land, restore the people, and heal the earth. And uh, we'll be doing that on September 28th at seven o'clock and look forward to having you there. Yeah, very good. I'll, I'll put the, the sign up link for that in our, our comments here. Um, that is part of the, the season of creation series that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, Keith, could you close us in prayer, please? Let's do that. God, creator of all beauty and wonder and wisdom, we pray for a world that is in unity with your wisdom and beauty and wonder, that it would heal 
of the soil and the atmosphere and the soul, that we might be one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at your heavenly banquet. Until then, give us a heart for creation. Give us a heart for this wisdom that you placed in all the earth. May we learn from the garden what you're trying to teach us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us this day with hearts to know your wisdom. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Keith, for being here. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. And we'll see you all next time. Take care.